everyone thank you for joining in the conversation on big cats it's turning out really exciting with so many people from so many countries talking about cats and of course you know i have always greatly respected and admired you as one of the foremost carnivore biologists in india so dr jhala is at the wildlife institute of india and he used to be known as the wolf man of india but subsequently has worked on so many other projects including the asiatic lion tigers and many more dr jhala welcome and please tell us about yourself and tell us about the presentation uh, thank you very much dr latika nath it's a great pleasure to see you again after so many years and thank you for having me on your show yeah i think i'll talk about uh, canid uh, i mean a felid and canid well uh, conservation but let me share my presentation with you so i as as you said i've worked with uh, many cat species and uh, since i last met you i started working with the dr ranjit singh whom you I talked yep. and interviewed yesterday uh, on the yep. cheetah so we are doing the reintroduction of the cheetah in india hopefully before i retire and i've started working with snow leopards as well in uh, in ladakh so that's but i'll talk today about tigers and lions as you had asked me to do that okay so a little bit of history might be relevant just to pitch the presentation uh, we all know that the most difficult species to conserve um, are large carnivores and more than anything else the large cats and that is because they compete for food with us they share space with us they predate our livestock and sometimes they often kill and eat us as well so what have we done we have waged a war against them for historical times um, we made sure that where we live these carnivores don't subsist they, they are eradicated and sometimes it's very difficult to eradicate a species from uh, the face of this planet so if they are state driven bounties uh, we have used poison and uh, even drop poison from the air to make sure that all carnivores in the landscape are killed and this contrasts a bit from what the western world looks at biodiversity and the species they live with compared to what the east does uh, in india especially the three religions which have evolved in the subcontinent hinduism and the two religions buddhism and jainism which are arose out of hinduism have taught people about reverence towards life and these religions look upon human beings as being custodians to the biodiversity of the planet while the western religions put dominion of humans over the rest of the planet especially nature and we are here to exploit nature this basic difference has resulted in survival of our biodiversity in country which are so densely populated like india and we have still not lost most of our species uh, not waged wars against them and as, as, if you were to look at the history the first protected areas in the world were established in india by king ashoka a buddhist king this feat is now attributed to yellowstone national park in the us but we had national parks in india way before that part of the world was known to the western world now coming to large large carnivores and large cats in general um we use them as surrogates for biodiversity conservation the reason is that they require large space and once you have the apex or the top predator conserved we make sure that the entire ecosystem on which it sustains itself is also protected and is doing well so uh, the the philosophy of indian conservation has been large projects like project tiger project lion which target not single species conservation but by conserving the apex carnivores we make sure that we are conserving the ecosystem as an entirety today the name of the tiger is as synonymous to india as is the taj mahal so we know india as being uh, one of the wonders of the world with taj mahal over here and so the tiger if you talk about tigers you talk about india so they both have become synonymous to represent india now the problems with tiger conservation are many fold in a country like ours most of first and foremost is that when the space required for tigers is enormous and we don't have it we have a huge number of people living on a on this part of the uh, planet but 1.3 billion people share this space and our protected area is a very small they are not like the serengeti or the yellowstone ecosystem which is 30000 70000 square kilometers the average size of a protected area in india is about 239 square kilometers with this to conserve large cats itself is a huge challenge top top of this is the 
fast rate of economic growth which india set up itself on um and uh, you know with a gdp of about 1.85 trillion us dollars um the stage is set for a confrontation between conserving our natural heritage versus development and i hope that this uh, there is a balance which is brought about and i'm going to talk about how this balance is being attempted to be brought about in this country a little bit of history uh, it was during the colonial era that uh, uh, we had lost most of our species uh, the indian tradition of um, being custodians uh, was was lost and game hunting and uh, killing for bounties became prevalent it is believed that around 40000 tigers survived in the indian subcontinent but by the time india got its independence and in the early 1970s when the modern conservation era started these tiger numbers had dwindled to about 1800 tigers or so this is what these are all estimates because there was no scientific assessment in those days it is only in the beginning of the modern era of conservation which started in the early 70s uh with the insistence of uh, two stalwarts that is dr salim ali and mr jc daniel from the bombay natural history society they wrote a letter to the then prime minister mrs indira gandhi informing her about the plight of the tiger the prime minister being an ardent conservationist herself took this very seriously and with the help of the worldwide fund world wildlife fund at that time uh, a million dollar grant was given to india and the rest of the money was pitched in by the central government we established nine nine tiger reserve uh, nine reserves from protected areas in india which has now grown to 50 tiger reserves it was uh, at this time also that the wildlife protection act was drafted uh, by the gentleman whom you interviewed yesterday dr m k ranjit singh uh it's nice to have him with us still and he's still very active in conservation but while we were basking in the glory of project tiger and it was initially a great success papers were written what to do when you succeed uh my former director who set up this institute mr h s kumar was one of the pioneering field directors of kana tiger reserve and uh, he then became the director of this place you can see him sitting here behind this vehicle here the first uh director of project tiger mr sankla was driving the jeep with the duke here and uh, this is an historical event but um, in the 1980s and 1990s um, the parts of the world which became rich were also the ones who were consuming a lot of biodiversity china and southeast asia what do you do when you get rich you need to show off your wealth and how do you do that you exhibit it in the form of what you covet most and wildlife parks and products became a fashion uh wearing clothes with wildlife eating wildlife using wildlife in traditional medicine and by the time in the 90s um the tiger populations had been devastated in china and in southeast asia the poachers turned their attention to india and while we thought that we had around 3500 tigers the real scientific estimate showed that there were less than 1500 tigers left in india this was around 2005 it was not until the debacle of sariska when poaching drove the population of the tiger reserve to extinction did the prime minister take cognizance of this problem and he created the tiger task force um sunita narayan which you see here in this photograph led the tiger task force and they came up with a wonderful um status uh, a report called joining the dots which took into a sense the socio political and cultural ethos of india and recommended um conservation Uh, actions in this country i think it's still a gospel and those of you who come from developing worlds i would recommend that you read this report and because it tell, it outlines how best conservation can be done in developing countries which have a lot of people and a lot of poverty so since then uh, one of the major lacunas which this report pointed out to was a lack of a credible monitoring system which was based on science they advocated a system that me and my colleague had developed at this wildlife institute of india and so subsequently mandated that india takes stock of its tigers every 4 years across the country and for tiger reserves on an annual basis and we have seen done this assessment right from 2006 to 2019 and we see a population growth um which uh, the initial figure which was officially said was about 3500 tigers we showed that the tiger population was actually less than 1500 tigers and then subsequently after implementing a lot of reforms the tiger populations have responded well and we have a annual growth rate of about 6% recorded across uh, all the tiger landscapes of this country how do we do this is what next i'm going to talk about the first and foremost uh, uh, problem with tigers in this country was uh, poaching 
and that is because it was market driven there was an illegal demand for tiger parts and products and we had to counter that uh, a lot of technology uh, technological interventions went into uh, countering poaching we use uh, something known as the electronic surveillance which is based on sensor networks of using thermal cameras and visual cameras with live monitoring across very sensitive borders this has been deployed in many tiger reserves corbett uh, kaziranga uh, some other parks where you can actually monitor the high profile parks where there's a you know the rhinos are also there which are far more um, um, in demand than tigers so this this is one thing the other thing is we implemented what is known as smart patrolling using using our uh, program known as n stripes it is not only used for uh, monitoring patrols and seeing that there is special coverage uh, uh, and recording crime but also it has got an ecological component which allows you to do transects uh, survey plots uh, look at occupancy surveys so we have digitized the entire mechanism of uh, landscape surveys on a mobile application which allows us to actually monitor tigers across vast landscapes and so forth uh, we use artificial intelligence to segregate photographs and photo uh, copies and that kind of stuff so there's a lot of technological implementation but it is the boots on the ground which make a difference and um, a tiger a special tiger protection force created by ex army servicemen who have retired from the army but are well trained and disciplined in the use of arms and uh, have been recruited in all tiger reserves and these are the people who have brought back the um, uh, the respect which law enforcement agency should have in tiger reserves so this has reduced poaching to a great extent through deterrence and uh, law enforcement training in how to fight crime uh, how to record evidence how to uh, uh, hold custody of uh, evidences and eventually which will stand the scrutiny of a uh, 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 legal system to lead to convictions so this was a major thing which uh, has reduced poaching as well as community participation and i'll come to that a little while later uh, if you look at the surveys which are done uh, in the map to the the left which i am pointing with my pointer which you can see is the ground surveys which are done in around 380000 square kilometers um of uh, forests which are the tiger habitats in the country every beat in the forest is surveyed using this mobile application looking for tiger signs so the blue dots here represent the survey paths across india which cover about 522000 uh, kilometers of effort um and the red dots here which you can see here are where tiger signs have been recorded so by just mapping these sign surveys you can actually have a distribution map of the tiger and you see that out of 381000 square kilometers tigers currently occupy about 90000 square kilometers so you have an occupancy right away uh, through these uh, digital application which you get on through the mobile uh, subsequently we go in and put camera traps and the last survey which was done in 2019 2018 to 2019 one of the largest surveys for wildlife ever done in the world we had 26000 camera trap locations and we captured about 34 million wildlife images out of which there were 76000 images of tigers we identified about 2461 unique tigers from the 76651 photographs which we got of tigers or that you have wonderful other wildlife as well and these pictures are also very important for looking at distribution maps of these uh, different wild animals in the forests of india so these tiger photographs are then digitized and the the stripe patterns extracted to identify individuals just like a fingerprint which we use for identifying human beings and this is a program developed by lex db a friend uh, in uk and uh, from the 76000 images that we have we identified 4000 uh, sorry 2461 individual tigers which does not include cubs the height of uh, uh, the tiger shoulder are excluded from this analysis this information is not only used for counting tigers but also for fighting tiger crime so for example when you get seizures done uh, when poachers are caught these skins are actually matched up to live tigers from a photo repository that we hold at the wildlife institute of india so we currently have about 4000 individual tigers in our repository all tigers from bangladesh nepal bhutan and india are in our repository and you can match skins from across um, these regions if they are in our database so for example this skin which was caught um, which was seized in kathmandu actually originated from a tigress which we had photo captured on outskirts of pinch and these tigers here were from the heart of corbett which were poached a few years ago um 
Secondly, what we do is we develop, since we have ground surveys as well as camera trap densities, we develop relationships between densities versus hope variates which determine wildlife abundance. For example, what you see here is the encounter rates of tiger pug marks and tiger density. You can see a very nice linear relationship. This is encounter rate of tiger scats and tiger density. These are tiger density categories and distance of uh, each grid, a hundred square kilometer grid from centers of urban centers, which are centers of uh, night lights, as uh, you can see them. Um, so, you know, there's a picture of India taken by, by a satellite picture of India taken at night. So all the urban centers get lit up. And what this tells us is that tigers prefer habitats which are far away from human habitation. And you get high density tigers in remote areas of the jungle. It is no big deal, but yeah, now you have data to say that. Uh, relationship with tiger prey, uh, tiger numbers increase as prey densities increase. And you can see a very nice linear relationship with tigers and their prey. And these covariates are extremely important for us to determine where tigers occur and how many in what abundance. So if you want to look at uh, prey requirements of tigers, each tiger requires close to about 450 to 500 prey to sustain itself and its cubs. And this is the ratio of uh, large ungulates, the size of a cheetah, to a single breeding tigress. So when you have ungulates being removed from a system, you lose tigers as well. And many of our forests, bushmeat consumption is still a major problem especially in the northeast and the tribal areas of Odisha, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh. Snaring is a major issue and snares not only kill ungulates but they also kill tigers and many other large carnivores which are non-target species because snares don't discriminate whom they catch. This is a chronic problem and uh, it is very difficult to address because it is related to poverty and uh, consumption of meat which is, uh, which is something which the people need to do. So until there is uh, poverty alleviation in these areas, I don't think we can address this problem very adequately through law enforcement. Now, how do we come up with tiger numbers for areas that we have not deployed camera traps in? Here we use something known as covariates, which I explained the earlier uh, in my um, earlier slides, the relationship between prey, uh, human densities, topographic cover, and so on and so forth. So these are the covariates you see here, the intensity of tiger sign um, in the form of pug marks and scats, prey density, human disturbance, covariates, night lights, lopping, tree cutting and camera trap data. They all are put together to come up with a tiger density surface. So these, these are the camera trap areas which you see in the red polygons, which are actually, actually where you do photographic capture, recapture. But tigers occur in all these uh, red areas which you see and by using these covariates in combination with specially explicit mark recapture, you can actually predict the density surface for all the area in the landscape where tigers do occur. So this is what we use to estimate tiger uh, numbers across India and I'll come to that in a little while in more detail. So the coefficients for uh, the covariates here which you can see, as tiger sign intensity increases, tiger density increases. As human disturbance increases, tiger density declines. And as prey encounter rates increase, tiger densities increase. So this is, uh, well, it makes ecological sense to say this. Now let's see how this works in real life. So this is the Tarai Arc landscape, which you can see here. This is Nepal, the Himalayas, and this is Tarai. So what we first do is we get the forest department to do sign surveys. So these are, each track is about five kilometers long, a swiggle green line, which you see here. So all tiger habitats in the Tarai are actually surveyed on the ground by ground surveys. Subsequently, wherever tigers are found or signs of tigers are found is marked in red here. So we know at the first glance where tigers are likely to occur. So we're interested in estimating tiger abundance in uh, uh, these areas where you saw the red dots. Uh, the yellow dots here represent where camera, cameras have been deployed. So mostly wherever tigers occur, cameras are deployed. But there are areas here which you can see here, uh, this part of the Tarai here, the Haldwani Forest Division. And this part, um, uh, this is uh, this is Corbett. Uh, sorry, this is Corbett. This, this is uh, uh, this is Lagga Bagga area. If you see uh, part bordering Nepal, this is Shukla Panta here in Nepal. So some of these areas have not been camera trapped, and we, tigers are still there. So we need to estimate numbers of tigers there. So there are uh, 3,500 camera trapped locations in the Tarai, and these are the camera trap locations where tigers were actually photo captured. 
So 598 individual unique tigers were photo captured in these uh, purple dots which you can see here. So that tells you the minimum number of tigers which are present in this landscape. Subsequently, you model this uh, in a, a specially explicit framework and you uh, use the covariates to predict tiger densities in the grid which you see here, which is the tiger occupied grid. And you have a uh, tiger number uh, close to, I can't read it here because I get the name plates here, it's I think close to about 50 more individuals, about 650 tigers or so uh, in this landscape. And again, you have the covariates of tiger sign, human disturbance and prey as you explain. So this is how tiger numbers are estimated across all forests which bear tigers in India. About 380,000 square kilometers are surveyed every four years. So where are our tigers? So you see this is the tiger density map of India and two major populations now, uh, which are the largest populations of tigers in the world. Uh, about 700 plus tigers in this region, which is the tripartite junction between Kerala, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, Bandipur, Madhumalai, Nagarhole, Satyamangalam, BRT, uh, tiger reserves over here and uh, tiger occupancy in about 12,000 square kilometers with 700 individuals. The Corbett, Rajaji, Pilibhi, Dudwa landscape is now continuous one tiger landscape with tiger presence across the entire landscape of the Tarai in the western Tarai having uh, about uh, 600 tigers. So today, there are close to about 3,000 tigers in India. Um, the IUCN estimates of 2015 put the global population of 3,159 tigers. So majority of the wild tigers are in India. And if you were to look at the accuracy of our last survey, it's pretty good because we got 82-83% of the tigers actually documented through camera trap photographs and 87% of our estimates come directly from camera trap areas with uh, specially explicit mark recapture. It's only the remaining 13% which come out of the extrapolated uh, covariate models. We not only get information on tigers but all co-predators at the same time. This is our estimate of leopards. The leopard estimate for the year 2018-19 is still ongoing and I don't have uh, a report ready for that. But hopefully by the end of this month we would have finished this analysis for 2019 as well. So in the tiger landscapes, we have close to about 8,000 leopards um, uh, uh, present in this landscape, which you see here. We also get simultaneously distribution and abundances of many other species, elephant distribution, wild dog, uh, most ungulates and so on and so forth. So the tiger surveys allow us not only to get information on tigers, but most mammalian biodiversity across tiger bearing forests, that is across 21 states of India. Uh, we also get information on vegetation and here you see for the first time a map of invasive plants which are across the Indian subcontinent. Uh, I don't think such data exists and under the umbrella of the tiger you can actually monitor a lot of other stuff which is relevant for biodiversity conservation. Sundarbans uh, posed a major challenge for us because the traditional methods which we use for uh, counting tigers don't actually work there. Uh, the environment is extremely hostile putting out camera traps, you're risking your life because the tigers there can get you, you can't run in the swamp, tigers can. So we used uh, radio telemetry and camera traps with attractants. So we lured tigers to cameras, instead of us going into tiger habitat, we got the tigers to come in and uh, give us self portraits. And you see here, um, importantly, a lot of bait consisted of fresh water. Fresh water is a, a very rare commodity in the brackish water of the Sundarbans and attracts a lot of wildlife and if you put a bowl of fresh water you get a lot of animals coming into drink including tigers and you can see here them taking the bait we use scent lure as well as sometimes meat to lure tigers so this is the sign survey and uh, we don't do it on uh, on foot here we do it with boat and their calls are surveyed which calls are local uh, channels in the mangroves and you look for tiger tracks which are very easy to spot and you get a distribution of tigers. So this is Bangladesh here and this is India and you can see the camera trapping which was done in 2014 and you get a density estimate. The official record of tigers in this landscape was close to 700 to 1000 tigers but what we found was close to about 200 tigers. So the estimates were over, uh, um, over estimates across the Sundarbans though of course um, it is one of the largest tiger populations in the world, uh, one of the top five. Yet, the tiger numbers were much lower because there is hardly any prey for the tigers to eat here besides a very poor density of uh, spotted deer which is found in the Sundarbans. So besides the countrywide surveys, we also do intensive uh, monitoring uh, of uh, some areas and I've studied three areas over the long term, Corbett, Kana and Ranthambore through camera trapping 
and through radio telemetry. Uh, we use satellite tags and GPS tags, but until you follow the animals um, on the ground, you cannot tie in the behaviors and how they use the habitat and for what purposes until the animals are actually seen. So um, we follow our animals 24-7 uh, uh, on foot, uh, uh, well we do fo on foot lions, but with tigers we do them on elephant back or through a vehicle and we use elephants on relays and get data on what the tigers do at day and night continuously with a relay of team of elephants. And this has given us a good insight on predation ecology and what all the tigers do actually, uh, which is unknown to uh, most science, which uses remote data classes. You can actually, we identify our tigers into uh, five age groups, cubs, less than one year, juveniles, sub-adults, adults, prime adults, and old adults, which is easy to um, identify them and age them in the field based on tooth wear, tooth eruption, and uh, jaw skull, as well as spots, uh, the pigmentation which comes in on the nose. And this we have used for known fate models uh, where tigers were individually identified at a regular interval and they were tracked for several years. And um, the, the known fate models work in a staggered entry design where tigers actually enter your matrix of live and dead at different times of the um, study. And then you can actually estimate how many of them died and what are the causes of their deaths. So this along with uh, camera trap mark recapture in an open population model allows you to estimate uh, survivorship, mortality, so on and so forth. And what you see here are the growth rates of the three populations, um, Corbett being zero growth rate, while Ranthambore and Kana having a uh, population increase happening over time. So the demographic parameters are uh, well, they were published for Nepal. We have most of the demographic parameters coming emanating from uh, the studies that we have been doing on the long term in India as well. And we use this to parameterize a population viability analysis. Now we find that um, um, Populations of tigers which have less than 20 breeding units have a very high probability of becoming extinct due to stochastic processes in nature. Especially if there is any deaths in these populations caused due to poaching, extinction is a certainty. So what you found is Panna and uh, Sariska, both isolated populations with small, uh, uh, small size tiger populations, both of them poaching wiped these uh, populations out. Um, so if you look at this graph here, this is uh, 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 the probability of extinction of tigers which are less than um, uh, 15 tigresses breeding, 20 tigresses breeding, extinction probability is extremely less. But if you have tiger populations which are more than 20 breeding units in the buffer and the core, um, then you have, even if some poaching occurs, extinction is controlled to a great extent. And the probability of extinction is actually less than 10%, even with one or two tigers being poached on a regular basis. So for Having 20 breeding units in a landscape like India, we need an area of about 800 to 1000 square kilometers, which is inviolate space for tigers. And this is what is recommended in the Wildlife Protection Act based on the simulation models that we, I'm showing you right now, that the ideal tiger reserve should have a core of about 800 to 1000 square kilometers. So what happens if you were to establish a core population of tigers um, in a, a tiger reserve, which is large enough and acts as a source, you see here with good protection, uh, this is the tiger distribution in Uttarakhand in 2006, core um, of Corbett acting as a source population and gradually you see that tiger distribution has expanded and occupancy occurs across all habitable habitats of Uttarakhand today. And this is just thanks to uh, Corbett source being well protected and spilling out tigers to occupy the landscape. So the good characteristic of a core, you'll see that the growth rate is almost zero. That doesn't mean that the tigers are not increasing. It's, it, of course, the tigers are not increasing, but they're reproducing quite well. And uh, the recruitment is actually going into dispersal. So this occupies the landscape. So can we increase our numbers of tigers? Uh, well, yes, many of our tiger reserves are way below carrying capacity. And uh, if you were to see some of them I have listed. So our 8,000 square kilometers is today available. Uh, which can easily be uh, uh, accommodated uh, with more tigers and we can have another thousand tigers added to our uh, population um, quite easily with a little bit of uh, restorative ecology and managing uh, the habitat for restoration of prey. Okay, so we have also mastered the art of reintroduction and supplementation. Um, the Panna and Sariska tiger populations have been uh, reintroduced and many tiger populations have been supplemented. 
uh, tigresses, I mean, sorry, tiger cubs are also, which are uh, often at a young age, are hand reared, taught to live in the wild, kill wild prey, and they have been successfully reintroduced in Pannam. And the second generation from these hand reared tigers are now available uh, in the wild. So you had good breeding of hand reared tigers as well. Yet I would recommend that it is better to do wild to wild uh, uh, reintroductions compared to hand rearing because there's always a risk that these tigers which are hand reared may come back to human habitation and can become dangerous to human lives. Uh, if you look at the home ranges here, this is Kana Tiger Reserve. Uh, these are breeding tigress home ranges which you see here, uh, very small and uh, you can see that this is the density map of tigers. High density is in blue, low density is in red and this is the density of prey. So there is a very high correlation with tiger density and prey density. High tiger density occurs in areas where there is high prey. These are male home ranges which you see here and the difference in what has been published about tiger ecology so far and what we know is that we believe that males used to be uh, males were believed to be very territorial but if you see here it is the females that are far more territorial than males there is hardly any overlap so what you see in this slide here uh, on the x-axis is the prey density and on the y-axis is the territories of breeding females so as prey density increases the uh, there's initially a decrease in the density and the size of female territories but after a certain point uh, it reaches an asymptote that means social uh, factors set in and tigers cannot be packed beyond a certain point. So the smallest territories which you see here are close to about 10 square kilometers. And tigresses don't have smaller territories than 10 square kilometers in which they can breed because that social regulation comes into the picture. These are the smallest territories we observe. And males being, um, uh, they have about 10 times the size of a female territory uh, in most of the areas that we have studied includes Rankambore as well as Corbett and Kana and I'll not dwell on the other sites but this is uh, what it is. Uh, what you see here in this side here is the distance from the core area of a tiger reserve and the density of these carnivores. Okay? So if you see this as the tigers exponentially decline as protection declines. Leopards also decline but their decline is not as steep as that of tigers. But if you see other species which are not protection dependent like jackals it really doesn't make a difference whether you are inside a protected area or outside in the human dominated landscape. So tigers are especially uh, conservation dependent species and without protection and a core area it is hard to get high densities of tigers uh, in, in human dominated landscapes. Uh, coming back to the size of uh, uh, areas which are required for large carnivores just to show you uh, about uh, uh, the context in which you can see the home ranges of lions here superimposed on the protected areas. Uh, this is Gir protected area, which is a sanctuary. Within this, the only inviolate space where my cursor is, is about 250 square kilometers of national park, which I'm mentioning here. This entire Gir has got Maldharis in it. So the only population of Asiatic lions in the world has only 250 square kilometers. And if you look at the size of a home range of a lion outside the protected area, it's about 700 square kilometers. It is impossible to hold a viable population of any large carnivore in these small protected areas. That was just to make a point that our protected areas are too small for holding viable populations. And because of this, coexistence with humans is the only possible strategy to uh, continue to have large carnivores existing uh, in this part of the world. So what have we done to do the best we can? Uh, we have a program known as incentivized voluntary relocation. And this is a package which is paid uh, to people who live inside protected areas to move out voluntarily with an incentive. There is no, the, the legal system in India prohibits evictions. You cannot evict anybody from inside a forest. It is the Forest Dwellers Act. Well, yes, the government can evict people for developmental projects. You can remove people if there's a dam coming up, if a road is coming up, and for development, eviction is possible. But for conservation, eviction is illegal. And what the, uh, the conservationists or um, the part of the government, the Ministry of Environment and Forest has done, is that we offer a package which is difficult for people to refuse. Also, people living inside forests are not that well off. Um, uh, small patches of agriculture that they may do around their settlements uh, are raided by elephants, by ungulates. Uh, so there is uh, always uh, 
high cost associated with them the livestock is often predated by large carnivores and there is always an element of risk to their life of course they know much better how to live with large carnivores and elephants than any of us do but the um, the quality of life inside a forest is uh, different and sometimes people or most often people opt for a better living where they have access to hospitals schools uh, colleges higher education electricity running water marketplace where they can sell their produce or uh, even buy purchase for themselves so um, um, mostly uh, they would settle for a colony like this than this and uh, with an incentive of about 1 million rupees um, being paid to an adult in the family people move out to create space for wildlife uh, india has invested a lot in um, uh, relocation uh, budgets uh, anywhere from uh, 5 million euros to about 25 million euros is the norm or annual expenditure are uh, given to people to move out to create space for wildlife and especially for tigers and this i believe is one of the most important conservation initiatives by the government which uh, pays dividends to both people because people are very happy to move out they get a nice package and they are happy in their life forms and uh, alternative livelihoods and biodiversity gets a space for itself so today we have created a mini serengeti about 34000 square kilometers of inviolate space uh, for tigers but the problem is that this space is not contiguous it is broken up into smaller uh, parts um, and so on and so forth so current occupancy of tigers is about 89000 square kilometers in india okay. um so it looks very nice if you look at this map here this is a map of central india um this is where latika did her uh, phd work bandogar uh, this is achanak marg tanha um uh, this is paint satpura and this is the forested landscape of central india and these are the tiger reserves and some protected areas like nora dehi which you see here so it looks very nice you have these uh, source populations here connected by corridors and this should form a perfect setting for having tigers in this landscape forever but if you have to put infrastructure on this these are just the road networks you can see that this habitat is fragmented it is surprising that tigers actually uh, traverse across these uh, um, barriers of for movement and they actually share uh, individuals and genes in many of these tiger reserves so this is the circuit scape out output of uh, uh, the landscape here the what you see here the yellow ones are actually the corridors which join the tiger reserves the pink ones are night lights or centers of urbanization uh, this is the city of uh, Nagpur here and Jabalpur here the highway number 7 traversing across Pench uh, which had to be mitigated because of cutting through a major corridor which connects to Kana and you can see that the highways here are present here and in this landscape tigers are actually moving across from one landscape to the other so this is the uh, genetic structure of tigers in central india this is kana this is kana pench then uh, corridor this is pench satpura melghat bandogad and tadoba and you can see that individuals actually are moving across the landscape between these uh, um tiger reserves um uh, crossing the barriers of these roads but for how long um so we have mapped all the tiger corridors across india based on the data sets that we have and it's published available online uh, prioritizing the villages where conservation needs efforts need to be put in to ensure that these corridors remain intact so this is a picture satellite picture of night lights and this is the central indian uh, corridors and if you were to look at this um over the 10 years you can see how human sprawl has increased in india and many of them have choked these corridors beyond recovery so this is the um, uh, gola corridor which cuts off the western uh, tarai from the eastern tarai this is corbett tiger reserve and tigers have to now go across the himalayas uh, small parts of the foothills of the himalayas to share the tigers in nepal that is shukla fanta and bardia and bidwa and so forth this corridor in the tarai is almost gone um the the umbrella uh, effect of tigers yes the tigers are a very good umbrella species provided we do not uh, over emphasize on increasing tigers beyond their threshold which is naturally dictated by habitat and the prey and in our zeal to increase tiger numbers many tiger reserve managers want to increase the tiger numbers indefinitely and this is something which uh, i would like to say that we should guard against just to tell you the impact on the co predators uh, for example uh, uh, leopards here 
tigers and leopards almost eat the same diet. There are some differences like the proportion of langur or small animals in the diet of uh, leopard is much more. But they eat almost the same items. And they also are active during the same time of the day or for that matter night. But if you were to look at what happens um, to um, tigers and leopards in terms of density, this is Kana Tiger Reserve and this is tiger densities and these are leopard densities. You see that they are specially different. Um, wherever there is high density of tigers, you will not have high density of leopards. If you were to look at this map here, on the y-axis you have the rate of increase of tigers. So as you go up on this graph, the density of tigers is increasing in space and over here it is the density of tigers which is increasing and the contour maps are showing you the density of leopards. So high density leopards which you can see in red and yellow occur when tiger densities are low or when actually the tigers are declining. So these areas of high leopard densities even though there is high tiger density are in areas where tigers are declining. This graph here, have a look at this. You have on the x-axis again tiger density and on the y-axis the rate of increase of tigers positive, negative, that means tigers declining here and tigers increasing here and this is the rate at which leopards are increasing. So leopards can only increase in areas where tiger density is low okay, or where tigers are actually declining. Okay, So very interestingly leopards and tigers uh, demographically also they are at, at any spot in time they do not occur in uh, contemporaneously at high densities but demographical response of the leopard is related to tiger densities and the rate at which tigers are actually growing in space. Considering Dhol which is another large predator which shares its space with tigers and eats almost the same prey as tigers do. Tigers also kill Dhol whenever they can and the Dhol partitions its time at a different uh, uh, temporal time scale. They are diurnal while tigers and leopards are nocturnal. But if you were to look at the density of Dhol which is on the y axis here and tiger density over here, leopard density over here. You see that Dhol occur in high densities which is the brown and the yellow here only in areas where tiger density is low. But they can tolerate high leopard densities. So the competition on leopard and Dhol is almost on an equal footing but tiger takes the toll on both leopards and dhol and is the dominant predator where all other predators are concerned. So if you were to increase tiger densities, it would be at the cost of other co-predators which are sometimes, uh, especially dhol, is sometimes more endangered than the tiger. Looking at the genetic structure of tigers across India, okay, we see that there are, though tigers are the same subspecies, Panthera tigris tigris, the IUCN has now reduced the number of tiger subspecies to only two, the Sunda tigers and the mainland tigers. And within the mainland tigers, the erstwhile five species, subspecies are now lumped into two management units, the Siberian tigers and all the others. So you can actually move tigers back and forth and that's probably the reason why they did that. But the recent genetic analysis, uh, genomic level, has re-established the role of individual variations of populations driven by vicariant events as well as by selection pressure and in India you can see there is a huge genetic diversity of tigers probably the most diverse tiger populations exist in India and what we have done is we have looked at this genetic diversity and the distinctiveness of each population and also looked at population vulnerability using these three matrices we have prioritized tiger populations for conservation investment. So what you see here is the tigers of the southern western Ghats and tigers of the northeast. This is the plains area and this is the northeastern hills. You see that there is a representation of northeastern tigers in central Indian landscape. So the tigers of central India, they have all the genes or the gene pool from across India. Yet the tigers from the northeastern hills and the southern western ghats are very distinct. If you were to look at this graph here, this tells you population size, divergence and diversity. So the population size is very small for these tigers over here. Okay, Which is on, the, if you look at this scale, this is zero here. And you can see that southern western ghats and the northeastern hills 
um, have uh, this is entire northeast, which includes Kaziranga as well. But the northeastern hills has less than a hundred tigers, so the population size is very small. If you were to look at all these areas, then the three priority landscapes where conservation investment actually needs to go is the northeastern hills, which are unique tigers, the tigers of the Sundar ones, which uh, sorry, the tigers of Simlipal, which had the only, only melanistic form, the golden tigers, which are only found in Kaziranga and the southern western guard tigers okay? so the three priority populations are mentioned here so what we are taking is we are taking tiger conservation to a different level where you want to retain um, not only free ranging populations which actually perform their ecological role this is this is what tigers are doing in india where in most of the world they cannot even do this but in many of our areas we have this uh, uh, potential of uh, performing ecological functions we want to take this to the next level of having free-ranging tigers which perform their ecological role but also retain their evolutionary potential. And this can only be done if we were to retain the entire extant tiger gene pool in its entirety. So tiger conservation or large carnivore in a nutshell, the last slide, is best to create large inviolate space for viable populations of large carnivores, tigers, lions, cheetah, leopard, whatever else to maintain habitat connectivity between source populations, avoid mixing people and carnivores, zone them, put fences if you need to, minimize poaching, especially in small populations, and control population in uh, problem animals immediately so as to prevent backlash uh, to the entire populations and species. This is, this is the ideal scenario, which is very, very difficult uh, uh, to actually implement in India. Since our protected areas are too small, for viable populations of most carnivores. You cannot have inviolate space which is large enough for viable populations. Therefore, coexistence with humans is an unavoidable conservation strategy in India and I have to say in many parts of Asia. Conflict therefore becomes inevitable and it is managing this conflict by mitigation and incentives and through awareness which is the crux of successful conservation. Understanding social ecological and political ramifications of conflict is required at site-specific levels to have appropriate mitigation. The best long-term strategy is to maintain large populations as large as possible, establish metapopulation structure and minimize poaching. Lastly, the fate of large carnivores is not in the hands of scientists, conservationists, conservationists or managers not on how society views and values them but what it is willing to pay and how it motivates the political will to conserve them. So this is the crux of large carnivore conservation. If people want large carnivores, we will continue to have them and this is only possible through motivation of political will and we are lucky that right from Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to current Prime Minister Narendra Modi, <coughs> transcending all party lines we have had the highest commitment for tiger conservation in our country. Thank you very much. That's all that for tigers. Thank you. That was amazing. We've now had leopards comfortable with vehicles walking quite happily yeah. through.